One of the things that was brought up in lecture was the subject of bacterial aging. So let's just say I have a, a bacterium here and then my my circular, my one circular chromosome, my nucleoid, and a couple of other proteins here, and I've had a lot of metabolic intake, and I decide it's time to undergo binary fission. So I go ahead and, and replicate this DNA here, and I'm going to do that in blue. So I have another piece of uh, bacterial uh, chromosome there, and then it's going to, through that wonderful Z ring that we just talked about earlier, uh, give us two unique are two genetically identical, sorry, uh, bacterial cells with their own uh, sets of DNA. And so I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that this is the same as this DNA here, but this guy here has the new, the just recently made DNA. So let's, well, we could divide this in, and this is, contains the old DNA and the old proteins. Meanwhile, this over here contains young, quote-unquote, uh, DNA and young proteins. And just, I, I don't know if you guys notice this, but believe me, you will. As you get older, your body, this is just something that happens to everything, whether it's a bacterium or whatever, it gets put under a lot of oxidative stress. And this is just a fancy word for the everything that happens metabolically um, uh, you know the electron transport chain oxidative phosphorylation puts us under oxidative stress and what this actually does is it marks um, the end of it with these things called little like pole tags and so these are the this would be the old pole here this this part if we were to draw like this is our Z ring here this is the old pole and it has these markers on it of of this oxidative stress that's been put on it. And so what's really weird and, and I kind of difficult for me to comprehend because I've always thought of prokaryotes, particularly bacteria, being something that acts and behaves uh, in terms of natural selection as an individual. But what we're actually discovering is that bacteria in colonies behave like organisms in colonies. Uh, so if there is, in a, say, like a biofilm or even in just a colony, a lot of the metabolic distribution is going to go, I'm going to say metabolic investment, okay? Investment, if this will fit, investment is going to go to the younger bacteria that doesn't have this old pole tag sign on it, which is kind of interesting that we're you know starting to change our attitudes and this is one of the things that's making us change our viewpoint of bacteria. Crazy stuff. Alright, so now that we've talked about that, let's just talk about microbial nutrition. And if you've ever taken an actual nutrition course, um, these two terms here are completely different from what you're probably thinking here. Um, anything that is a macronutrient, this just means you need a lot of it. Um, so, uh, not necessarily you need in this case, we're talking about the bacteria here. The bacteria needs in mass, in massive amounts. Amount. Um, this is, and this is refers to, I guess, elements. I should probably specify that. So, this is elements. that the bacteria needs in massive amounts, okay? And this, uh, so I guess if you could, if we were to list, I guess, an examples of these, um, uh, there's actually a really cool mnemonic that I saw <laughs> uh, on, I think it was the micro wiki, uh, chinops, yeah. Chinops are macro nutrients, okay? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Everything that's the basis of organic chemistry, one. And two, um, everything that we have those inclusion bodies that we work so hard to store up. So these are all things that we need that they're considered under macronutrients. I really do think that magnesium um, should be one of those that's considered in abundance just because of its uh, role as a... Uh, uh, cofactor for kinase enzymes, but nevertheless, we don't include it. But uh, micro, as the name implies, this is something that's needed in little amounts, 
relatively in, in, in reference to this is all in reference to the dry weight of the bacteria so obviously for certain species um, some things may be uh, in more or less amounts than the others but these generally tend to be um, intracellular cations every time I write that I cover it here because it's a positive thing slash intracellular anions which are negatively charged, so positively charged, negatively charged. So this would be like your potassium, magnesium, calcium. This would be your chlorine, um, iodine, things like that. Um, and then to a very much even lesser extent, uh, transition elements. I feel like I should have included a periodic table to this. Um, but this is, you know, I don't know if you guys, so I'll just, I'll list some examples here. So cations, anions would be like sodium, potassium, things that play a role not only in um, our cells, but also in bacterial cells as well. Magnesium 2+, plus. this is calcium 2+. Plus. Sodium, um, potassium, calcium, magnesium, all have really useful roles. Anions would be like, chlorine is probably the most commonly used, um, trying to think of one that isn't over here uh, in terms of an anion. I know that iodine is used for certain reactions. Just, I mean, we're not being too specific here. And then transition elements, uh, what we need, this includes your iron uh, to, to a much lesser extent. Um, really, iron's the only thing that I can think of that's uh, vitally important. Let's see if my notes have anything else to say about that. No, it does not. Um, <laughs> should probably have gone into more detail, but iron's the only thing that I can think of. There's probably others, but they exist in so little amounts, it's not vitally important. So that's the difference between those two. So now, um, let's just talk, bef actually before we... Mm, yeah. Growth mediums. Okay, so now let's talk about simple versus a complex growth medium, okay? So what's the difference, I guess the main difference between the two, and they're both, uh, this is something that you're gonna do in lab. Like, you know, I have a, I'm in a microbiology lab and I wanna grow these two. Let's just talk about it in red. Okay, so simple uh, growth medium. This is where we have a known concentration. Um, and mass, this is usually in the unit of grams, grams. Um, of, I guess, of nutrients in the medium. Okay, so this, let's just think about this. I know how many grams of glucose I would have in my Petri plate um, that I would want to grow for certain bacteria. So say that I know that this has, I don't know, 50 grams of glucose. That's, <laughs> yeah, 50 grams of glucose. We'll say that I know that much and I know the concentration, the molarity of, or yeah, the molarity of the glucose of whatever that I'm dealing with. Um, you know, sodium concentration, the nitrogen concentration, and if I have glucose, that's a specific element, but it's usually just uh, carbon things like that. Down to the teeth, I know the concentration of each of these in uh, a simple growth medium. So for a complex, on the other hand though, this is usually made from uh, a living organisms. So like a <laughs> brain heart uh, infusions, blood augers, you know, things like that. Uh, we do not know. It is a unknown uh, yeast type of uh, solutions, things like that, that we mow grass compounds, unknown concentration and mass of the nutrient contents. If I have a, a, a plate of blood auger, I don't know how much glucose or anything like that is in it, but I know that it's got a pretty good source of things that bacteria need. And this usually, these usually come from nature, from natural, they're derived from natural substances. Substances such as blood, 
an example, and this is something that is um, made in a laboratory. Um, some manufacturer will make it, and so I'm just going to say manufactured. Manufactured um, to produce these. This is kind of the 